Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1, says this in the New International Version, A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 1. And um, most of you will know, but not everyone will know, my mother passed away yesterday. And I was greatly encouraged by the study I've had in Ecclesiastes, and I had chosen this verse to start with about a month ago. And I ask you to think about this. How can you say that the day of death is better than the day of birth? I want to explore that uh, tonight and share some thoughts around life, more so than death, but... Um, um, Seems a little ironic that I'm here speaking tonight, the day after my mother's death. Uh, some said I shouldn't. The elders offered me an opportunity to pass. And Keith, you're online. If I can't finish, Keith will finish up for me. But uh, Keith, I want you to speak from Ecclesiastes tonight. Keith, thank you for offering to fill in. But uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with you what the Lord's uh, placed on my heart. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. Uh, my mother had a good name, and I believe her day of death was better than her day of birth. She was born on the banks of the Bonachere River, at home, rural farm. Who knows what support her mother had in terms of birth, but uh, her day of death yesterday was glorious, and many of you shared that with us. Um, we're missing her name on the screen tonight, No Goalie Black, 1935, but she's in heaven enjoying what the Lord has for her. And I rejoice, and our family's rejoicing, and we're doing good, and it's partly around uh, what we can take from Ecclesiastes as encouragement for our way of life. I want you to um, understand that uh, I feel the Lord uh, guided me to this book for tonight's purposes, and I am praying that someone here tonight needs uh, to get a sense of why the day of death is a good day. A year ago or so, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, not connected to our fellowship, he recommended a book to, my, to me. It's called Living Life Backwards, How Ecclesiastes Teaches Us to Live in the Light of the End. Has anybody read that book? I don't necessarily recommend it. My friend recommended it three times, the best book he's ever read, and um, it's, it's a good study on Ecclesiastes, but um, reading the book of Ecclesiastes for yourself and studying it for yourself is perhaps most helpful. I enjoyed the title, Living Life Backwards. The essence of the book is if you understand that your death is coming, you're gonna live differently. If you were told, uh, you have five days today, from today, before you die, you would live your life entirely differently. And part of the study of Ecclesiastes is, is learning to live your life backwards, recognizing that someday you will die. Let's uh, just refresh ourselves a bit by looking in at uh, chapter one of Ecclesiastes. My uh, approach tonight was to give a summary of, of the whole book, not necessarily speak at length about death. That's part two of my study. I'll, I'll save that for another time. But uh, Ecclesiastes is full of statements around life and death. And uh, let's hear what we read about in chapter one of Ecclesiastes says this, the words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all this labor at which he toils under his son? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun sets, it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. 
all streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than anyone can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And I'll pause there. And perhaps if this is new to you, you would start to wonder, what on earth is this book trying to get at? What on earth is the author trying to say? Why is he saying everything is meaningless? Why is he saying there's nothing new under the sun? My wife has a quirk. She picks up a book and reads the first chapter or so and then jumps immediately to the end of the book. So I want us to do that tonight. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I think if we understand that Ecclesiastes makes sense if we persevere reading it right to the end and reading what Solomon uh, concludes as his summary, Ecclesiastes makes perfect sense. So in chapter 11, he starts to talk about remember your creator. And then we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong man stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the streets are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire is no longer stirred, then man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the street. Remember him, let's remember your creator, before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. Not only was this teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goats or collected sands, like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. That's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, and God will bring into judgment everything, whether it is good or evil. I'm confident many of you have studied Ecclesiastes and thought through some of the thought-provoking statements that Solomon makes. Uh, this book is part poetry, part a collection of proverbs, and at times confusing, but at times very clear. And Solomon wisely said, here's the summary of the matter. And I think if we start with that, we can understand Ecclesiastes in, in a new light. Lucas, last week when he was preaching from the parables, he said sometimes you have to reinforce the bad news in order to share the good news. I captured that thought from Lucas last week, and I think Solomon was filling us with a bunch of bad news, and then said, here's the good news at the end. Remember your creator. 
fear God, keep his commandments. That's good news. That's gospel. And we get a chance to proclaim that gospel. Remember your creator, fear God. Interesting book, Ecclesiastes. Uh, the term Ecclesiastics is a um, Greek word for uh, Ecclesia, which means assembly. Um, some people would infer it's about a church. I think it's more about a school. Some people use the term the preacher wrote this. I like the translations that refer to a teacher. Um, we read a lot in Ecclesiastes. We read very little of harvest time, but in chapter 3 it does say there's a time to plant and there's a time to take up or a time to harvest. Chapter 3 is all about there's a time for certain things, a time for birth and a time for death. Exploring um, those thoughts, um, it's interesting the Jewish perspective on Ecclesiastes. They read it every fall during the uh, Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. It's a required reading during that uh, festival. That festival is the, uh, uh, purportedly the most joyous time in the Jewish festival season. And they are required to read Ecclesiastes and they would read, everything's meaningless, meaningless, mean, everything's meaningless. And I wonder how they react to that. But we can react, I think, in a more positive sense. So uh, one of my first thoughts was, uh, I don't understand why um, the term meaningless, meaningless is used. Some of your older translations, like King James would say, Vanity, vanity, everything vanity. I never understood uh, that either. So a good study tool would, would help you with this, that uh, when you see the term meaningless or vanity, it's a Hebrew word called helava. And I don't think a correct translation is meaningless. Helava is referring to mist or vapor that's fleeting. So I like the thought things are fleeting. Life is fleeting. And Solomon all, often says, a chasing after the wind. That's the sense I think he's trying to get at. If, if you're living life, it's like chasing after the wind. It's fleeting. It's, it's like a vapor. I don't think it's meaningless. I think by the end tonight, I'll, I'll suggest it to you. There's a lot of meaning in life, and we take uh, meaning for our life. 37 times hell of a is used. 29 times Solomon refers to the term under the sun. And he is clearly and specifically talking about the physical realm that we can see and touch. He is not referring to uh, God's kingdom, God's uh, authority, uh, spiritual words. So when he's referring to things of life, it's specifically things under the sun, things we touch and feel and understand. Um, at the end, he gets towards the spiritual realm where God is in control. But he often uses the term under the sun 29 times. And if we refer to uh, think of that thought, there's nothing new out of the sun. I, I worked through it a bit. Um, in a general sense, we would agree there's nothing new under the sun. We may come up with some new ideas, but in a sense, they're not new. And if I pair it with Revelation 21, I believe it's verse 14. Someone sent that to me yesterday as a way of encouragement. Revelation 21, he makes everything new. As we understand uh, God's purpose for what we go through here under the sun in the physical realm, we understand that there's a new dimension we'll enjoy someday with our Savior where he makes everything new. And Solomon isn't there. He's, he's referring to the physical word. And partly as we work our way through Ecclesiastes, it's important to know that Ecclesiastes isn't really a standalone book where you can apply uh, rules for life solely based on Ecclesiastes. If Ecclesiastes teaches us to obey the commandments of God, we have to go 
find where those commandments are and understand those commandments. So Ecclesiastes isn't a standalone live your life according to Ecclesiastes type book. It's Solomon writing, uh, guided by God, guided with purpose, uh, giving us some things to wrestle with and think through, but pair it with other passages of scripture. 28 times Solomon refers to wisdom. Sometimes it's his wisdom, sometimes it's our wisdom. Um, there is a sense that we understand things as we apply wisdom to our life. And the other fourth most common theme in Ecclesiastes is death. And we re read and think about death in every chapter of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 9, 1, specific, 1 to 6 explicitly discusses how death comes to everyone, both the righteous, the wicked, the good, and the bad. And those thoughts of death can scare us sometimes, shake us sometimes, but they can also lift us up and encourage. We cannot argue that we are not destined to die. We cannot argue that uh, we can escape death. I'm one that uh, stands firmly in the state described in, in chapter 12 where all my body parts are falling apart and failing. And that comes to all of us. It's inescapable what, what, what we read in, in, generally inescapable, what we read about growing old in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. In my teen years, fellow came into our chapel. His name was Murray Getty. He was a shanty man. Shanty man preached in uh, bush camps all through northern Ontario, Algonquin Park. They specifically had a mission to uh, lumbermen um, hidden away in rural parts. Murray Getty came to our chapel and he spoke specifically of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, growing old. He's about 65 at the time. I thought, oh, I'll never get there. I, I understand where you're at. I'm never going to be there. Um, that's for old people. Um, I'm now 64, recognizing I'm firmly embedded in Chapter 12. And I remember uh, some of you are sports-minded, but uh, teenage years, I would twist my ankle, I would twist my knee, and it would hurt for a while, and I would think to myself, oh, when I'm old, this will all be worth it. Um, uh, I'm now old, and my knees and my ankles are probably the better parts of my body, but um, uh, rejoicing that um, we grow old together. And my question specifically for you is, um, how old is too old? When it says, remember your creator in the days of your youth, would you say you're beyond that? Would you say, no, I'm too old for that. I don't have to remember my creator because that's for the youth. I know as I grow older, I'm always say, I'm, I'm young for my age. Uh, 65 is the new 75. And but old people are, are, are living this, but... Um, my question for you is, do you feel young? Do you feel you're beyond your youth and you don't have to uh, remember the Creator anymore? No, we are, we are all to remember the Creator at whatever age. It goes on to describe how we grow old. Uh, things start to fall apart in our body. Uh, there'll be days when you say, I find no pleasure in them. I don't think any of us are there yet, but um, we grow old together None of us are too old to say we don't have to remember our Creator. We don't have to fear God. If you're young here tonight, you're firmly embedded in, in this thought. And uh, I was there, and uh, I thought, oh, I have my whole life ahead of me. I'll, I'll get around to remembering my Creator. Um, no, start now. Start when you're young, and uh, your life will be so much better for it. In this uh, section in chapter 12 where it comes to the conclusion of the matter 
Here is the conclusion. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, everything, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. There's gospel there. We, we are a people privileged to understand that God has given us commandments, that God has given us his word for purpose, that he has told us how we're to live, gives us uh, rules for living. And he says, if you do this, that's right, and that's good, and that's righteous. If you do this, it's wrong, and it's evil. And I am going to judge you someday. And we have a gospel that proclaims Jesus Christ came to this world to save sinners, to save them from judgment, to save them from the penalty of their sins. And we encourage people to accept Christ as Savior and avoid the judgment day that's to come where their sins will declare them lost. Let's be faithful to proclaiming the gospel. Lucas uh, encouraged us the last two Tuesdays to uh, proclaim the gospel, and I echo that thought. God loves us. We're not alone in this world, and that gives us meaning. God loves us. That gives me huge meaning. God has plans for you. That is meaning to me. God saves you. That gives my life meaning. God knows your name. That gives my life meaning. God calls us to good. God will judge us for how we live. That gives my life meaning and purpose. I love the thought, remember your creator, specifically making it personal. God wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants you to know him as your creator. Solomon doesn't say, remember the creator, remember our creator, remember your creator. God wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us. And as we understand that, I believe it gives our life tremendous meaning and purpose to go forward and live according to his word, according to his commandments. Let's remember our creator in the days of our youth. I want to take a thought about uh, what does it mean to have a good name? What does it mean to have a good name? It sort of starts with the conclusion we just read. So we're going to be judged according to our activities, whether they're good or evil. So our good name starts with what are our actions? What are our deeds? Are they good? As we understand what's good, our name becomes good. Is that sufficient? What does it mean to have a good name? So Ecclesiastes 7 and 1 again says, a good name is better than perfume. And um, I'm going to suggest there's three parts to having a good name. First is the good name in the eyes of God. Good name in regards to your family a good name in relation to others. Good name in regards to this would suggest this. There'd come a time when God will judge. I want him to say of my life, well done, good and faithful servant. I want him to say, your name is good. It's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I picture a scene where I arrive at heaven and I say, look up, June 7th, 1967, around 8 p.m. My name is written there. My name is good because I'm written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name written in the Book of Life? Is your name good? Would God say, well done, good and faithful servant? We need to have a good name in regard to God. First and foremost, make sure your name is written in the book of life that God would say you're doing good. That good name translates into how our family sees us. How does your family see you? That's a challenging thought. Uh, what's going to be written on your gravestone, your grave marker? Will your family ever visit it? One of my favorite movies is Saving Private Ryan. Time's slipping by fast, but um, 
10 men go in search of a, uh, uh, a young guy in uh, World War II in Germany. Um, I'm not going to go into the story. It's a tremendous movie. That man is saved. Those 10 guys lose their life to save him. At the end of the movie, he turns to his wife when he's at the grave marker of, of the captain that saved his life. He says to his wife, was I a good man? It's an important thought to ask yourself before you're in the grave. Was I a good man? What does my family think of me? <clears throat> I think of my mother. My mother was a good mother. My mother was a good woman. My mother um, was good. And over the last week, people have poured out thoughts and praise and encouragement about her good she goes to the grave with a good name according to her family. And then in relation to others, similarly, what do others think of you? What, what does the world think of you in particular? Those that would hate you, um, hate you because you're a Christian, hate you because you're a goody goody. Um, let's make sure that the world knows that we're good, 2 Corinthians 9.13 would say, because of the service by which you've proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. We have a tremendous opportunity to proclaim the gospel because we, we do good in other people's life. They may not appreciate it. They may not want it. But God's word encourages us to think, they will praise God because of our good name. I encourage you to think of what your name is in the eyes of others, in the eyes of your family, in the eyes of God. And then finally, <clears throat> I'll just conclude with thought around life has meaning. Life has meaning. As we understand why our Creator created us, why our Creator knows our name, why our Creator loves us, why our Creator sent a Savior for us. Our life has meaning. It's not meaningless. Life is not meaningless. Life is not vanity. Uh, but life is fleeting. Life is like chasing the wind. It is fleeting. We all recognize it. That, um, time is flying by. And I encourage you to live the dash. If your uh, gravestone has your name, good name, birth date, death date, and there's a dash in between those two dates. We are living that dash right now. And it's a blip in time in terms of eternity. And we are given opportunity to redeem that dash, to be uh, important in people's lives, to be good to others, to be good uh, according to what God has commanded us. I love uh, Ecclesiastes 3.11. says this, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He also set eternity in the heart of man. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. When we read Ecclesiastes chapter 1, it seems to infer life is just a circular thing. Days come and days go. Sun comes up, sun goes down. Years go by. Um, <clears throat> growing up uh, in my teen years again, um, hanging out with guys, one, one fellow great guitar player liked Harry Chapin music. Uh, we would sing, all my life's a circle, sunrise ends and down. The sun, moon comes through, the nighttime till the morning comes through. All my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. The season's spinning round and round. The years go rolling by. As I sat in my little group of friends singing that song, I, I knew, I knew that um, I could tell them why. The season's spinning round again. There was a designer, there was a creator, and he gave us day and he gave us night and he gave us um, sun, moon, and stars. And while life does seem like a circle, Solomon gives us a little glimpse in Ecclesiastes 3.1. Everything's going to be beautiful. It's time. It may not make sense right now, but 
in its time, and Revelation 21 points to everything's going to be made new and beautiful. He has set eternity in the hearts of men, or he has set eternity in the human heart. We can convince people to think about the Creator because they know that there is something more than this little dash in life. There is something greater. There is something beyond uh, death. And as we are bold about proclaiming our faith in my teenage years when I knew there was a reason why things were spinning around and around, I wasn't very bold. Um, <clears throat> let's encourage one another to be bold about our faith and proclaim reason for why things seem to spin around. But there is an eternity. Life is linear. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon encourages us to find wisdom. Solomon encourages to find meaning in our work. It is possible to find meaning in work. Work is, is a consequence of sin, but there are ways that we can find meaning in that and purpose in our work. Solomon encourages us to find joy in our spouse. He intends men and women to, to be together, to partner together. A cord of three strands is not easily broken, is often used at weddings, but um, he encourages us to find a spouse. We don't always have a spouse, but there's a joy and meaning in partnership with another person. Um, Solomon encourages us to find meaning in worship, not to be careless about our worship. Solomon encourages us to find joy in our food and drink. And as we consider those tonight, we would hopefully agree that Life has meaning. Life has purpose. We are here on earth, uh, a blink in time, a vapor, a chasing after the wind, but God wants us here for a purpose. Let's seek out that purpose. We don't all have the same purpose. One of Lucas's proverbs would suggest some have ten um, coins, some have five coins, others have one. That's true. We're not all the same, but God has purpose for each and any one of us. Our real life extends far beyond what we see here on earth, far beyond the sun. It's full of meaning. We live to improve our live, name, not go back and try and fix the past. I encourage you to think through Ecclesiastes. I hope I've, I've whet your appetite a little bit in terms of... Um, what's in Ecclesiastes. There's a lot that we will think about in terms of death at some point, but um, life has meaning would be my uh, key point for tonight. We're called to remember our Creator. We're called to make sure our name is good with God. Um, we're called to know if our name is good with God, our death can be better than the day of our birth that it's better to go into a house of mourning. And um, finally, uh, seek out meaning and purpose in our life with God's help. I encourage you to uh, study Ecclesiastes on your own. It's, it's um, a rich book. I had to uh, work my way through it and um, find the nuggets that I've shared with you tonight. Some, sometimes like a gold miner where you're sifting through a lot of gravel and there it is, a gold nugget and you take it and embrace that gold nugget. There's lots of other nuggets in uh, Ecclesiastes to take to heart as well. I trust I've encouraged you tonight. There's something uh, uh, beyond this life. There's meaning in this life but uh, there is another life to come and um, we rejoice in that with the help we've been given from Solomon tonight. Words written long ago that apply to our hearts and minds tonight. Uh, trust you've been encouraged by that.